Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much. In the meantime, I uh, will be trying to uh, share my screen uh, for my PowerPoint relation. But uh, in the meantime, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to uh, be able to uh, to be with you uh, today online. Of course, it was, as the director said, unfortunate that we are not able uh, to uh, be present uh, live. I, until two weeks ago, I had the clear idea that I would uh, join you in Bonn, uh, but uh, because of uh, the regulations uh, and the situation with COVID-19, uh, I have to do it uh, from a distance, uh, which has to a certain extent also, as the rector said, an advantage, uh, because in the past you would meet with maybe 100 people from the university and the guests uh, and uh, uh, some uh, invited people from your network. Uh, but now you have the possibility to uh, be uh, together in a very uh, uh, global environment with visitors, presenters, participants from all over the world. So in certain sense, there's also opportunities that the COVID-19 pandemic creates of how to make much more international interaction. Uh, uh, I'm trying to see if I can share my screen, but it says the host is able to attend the screen sharing. So if can they maybe uh, allow me to uh, to share my screen? Uh, is it yes. shared now? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. It's working. That's great. Thank you. Uh, so the key question that. Uh, we address during this event uh, is why internationalization and that has been always a topic that was very close uh, to my research on internationalization of higher education the rector said we have today more the theoretical concepts and tomorrow the pra practical uh, uh, aspects of internationalization i think that the research on internationalization of higher education has always been a scholar practitioner kind of research where uh, we learn from our experience and I have been, as been said in the introduction, my uh, practitioner self, I have been very active as Director of International Affairs in two Dutch universities and Vice President of International Affairs in the University of Amsterdam and always have seen that as a, uh, a combination uh, research uh, uh, by basis of practice. Uh, and the question why is very essential and uh, is not something that there is one answer to that there are many different answers and contexts and values and missions uh, are very driving why we are internationalizing and are changing all over time so that will be an important part of uh, what i'm going to say but before doing that very briefly about the center for international higher education which i have been directing over the past five years and actually I am retiring from that on the 1st of November, so this will be my last month as a full director. I will continue on a part-time basis as academic uh, director of the center. Uh, but uh, it was already founded in 1995, so 25 years ago, by my predecessor, Professor Philip Albach, uh, with the idea that higher education research and practice have been in general very national. So we know a lot about higher education in Germany, in the Netherlands, in the United States, in Canada, in, in China, etc. But very little about the role of higher education in the global context. And uh, to make uh, a much more aware about how higher education is interconnected and plays a role in the global uh, society we live in, he founded the Center to understand that which is quite unique, certainly in the, in the American context, but also globally that there's very little research about international higher education. And I have had the pleasure to uh, succeed him and uh, focus also on my interest uh, from an internationalization background, much more on what is happening in higher education. We think that higher education as this mission is, need to be understood in this global context. And uh, that uh, is certainly in the United States where they think that American higher education is the best and the greatest in the world, and to a certain extent it is, can be easily copied by other ones, which is absolutely not possible. We do that by research and analysis. We do that by publications and uh, com informed commentary and blogs and uh, newsletters, etc. We do that in education and training. 
Uh, and we do that by networking. We are a very small center and we network with scholars from all over the world uh, that are related to our center because we also think that only that kind of research that we do can be done in a networking environment from scholars around the world. We cannot tell what's happening on higher education in Africa, in Latin America, or in Asia. We have to have scholars from that region there. We cannot tell everything about what the global context without having that comparative and critical, a scholarly and pra uh, practical perspective in it. So networking is very essential. And I think even after COVID-19, uh, as also the director said, that will be much more important to do because we have to link together and we can now much more easier link together because we have this uh, digital uh, possibility to be networking uh, in doing joint research and joint teaching and, and joint uh, uh, publication and dissemination. We do that uh, by training. We have a doctoral program. We have an MA in international higher education. We have a dual degree with the University of Guadalajara in Mexico. We have a certificate and we do professional development. And we always do that with influence from people who are teaching in our programs from different parts of the world. So, for instance, one of the other speakers uh, today in the conference, Ariane Gayadon, who was a doctoral student uh, and graduate uh, from uh, the center, now is teaching also in our uh, Master in International Higher Education. And we have teachers from all over the world uh, that are participating in our program. Uh, we do that as a community. Uh, we have graduate assistants from all over the world. We have visiting scholars from all over the world. We have research fellows from different parts of the world, and we have our global network. And that, I think, is the future of international research. So why can we do these things? Because we are connected with each other, and by joining forces, we are able to do that. And by the way, we also do that via our publication, International Higher Education, which is four times a year published by DOZ uh, publishers in Germany together with us uh, in which we online for free give every uh, four times a year an overview of what is happening in higher education in the world and you can subscribe to that by going to uh, our website international higher education or to the DOZ website uh, to get that information that as a little bit of a background but also as an example of how you can internationally collaborate to make uh, things work Going to the theme of why internationalization. The most important to start with is that internationalization is not a goal in itself, but a means to an end. So why internationalization cannot be described simply by saying, well, we have to internationalize. Uh, no, it has to be related to the core missions of higher education, which is education, research, and service to society. And so internationalization can only be effective if it has a role in improving the quality of what we do in, uh, in higher education. So internationalization should not be an isolated aspect of higher education, but should be at the core of quality assessment and quality improvement and quality assurance in higher education. That is very fundamental as a first point to make. We have to realize that internationalization as a strategic concept is relatively new. Of course, there's always reference to the fact that universities have been international uh, even from the time of the Middle Ages and Renaissances when uh, the philosophers like Erasmus were wandering scholars and students had to go from one place to the other to, uh, to teach or to learn. Uh, and that has always been part of higher education. But it has always been pretty marginal and fragmented and only and something like 40 years ago 35 years ago when the globalization of our society started to become much more at the core front uh, and the, uh, the end of the cold war uh, internationalization became a much more strategic aspect of higher education we had to see why we were having to link together and so it has always been something that is defining from not only why, but the what and how we can do at the local level, at the institutional level, at the national level, in the European context or in the African context. Uh, that has been 
very essential only since 35 years, and in particular starting at the institutional level, but later on moving also to the other levels. Internationalization is driven by a broad range of rationales of why we are doing this. There are political rationales, uh, uh, for instance, uh, after the Second World War, uh, the Fulbright program by, in the United States was an example of why the government are saying, well, we have to send stu uh, scholars and students abroad and we have to receive students and scholars because as a superpower, we have to be connected with the rest of the world. We have to understand the rest of the world. So we have to do that. And the same thing happened in the Soviet Union uh, and uh, for all kinds of political and uh, ideological reasons. There is development cooperation and higher education is driven by political rationales. Uh, there are other reasons why politicians uh, are using higher education as a way of diplomacy and soft power. Uh, certainly at the moment, a very important factor in uh, developing branch campuses and other uh, uh, relationships. Uh, Taking, for instance, the Silk uh, Road uh, in China, um, the Confucius Institutes, all those kind of things have a very political dimension and the current geopolitical tensions in the world are also an expression of why internationalization is very much driven by political reasons. There are economic reasons, economic reasons in the sense that internationalization is important because the industry uh, and the economy needs talents that are driving the global knowledge economy that we are in. Uh, it's economic in the sense that institutions, governments, see internationalization as a source of revenue. Yeah, Australia, United Kingdom, uh, many institutions uh, around uh, the world are seeing tuition uh, as an economic reason for internationalization. There are social and cultural uh, factors that drive the internationalization. Uh, that we, in particular now with our much more interconnected world, we need to understand the different social and cultural dimensions of it. Uh, we also think uh, a very driving force, for instance, in the United States uh, for uh, the study abroad programs to send their students uh, abroad was not so much to send them abroad to learn something academically, but really to give them a less provincial attitude to the world by sending them for a semester abroad uh, uh, to mainly to Europe. And there are, of course, also very clearly academic reasons to improve the quality of our research, to improve the quality of our education. Uh, all those factors are also playing an important role. And those rationales of why we're doing it can be different by stakeholders. So uh, it can be very different that a government wants to, um, to internationalize or a ministry of education might be a different, even have a different rationale than a ministry of uh, commerce. Uh, or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, institutional leaders might have uh, a different rationale than deans, and deans might have different rationales than faculty, and faculty might have different rationales than students. So it's a very complex uh, collaboration of different rationales and different stakeholders that are uh, important to keep in mind. And those rationales and those contexts change over time. So internationalization is quite different at the end of the 80s compared to the end of the 90s, compared to 10 years ago and to compare now, because the context has changed. Uh, and the whole approach to internationalization has been changing over all those years. And what we will see now, uh, the big question, will COVID-19 and other geopolitical and economic aspects that are related to that, will that also change the context and by that, the rationales for internationalization of higher education. And that was something I will come uh, back to at the end of my uh, presentation. And internationalization, both national and institutional, can be very fragmented, ad hoc and marginal, uh, which is still the case in many institutions of the world, where you see that it is only a few aspects of internationalization are uh, uh, related, for instance, mobility, uh, mobility for credits like the Erasmus program, which is driving very much the internationalization of higher education in Europe, uh, uh, together with the research programs of the European Commission. Uh, 
that might be one aspect, but it might be all, uh, degree mobility, like for instance in the UK and Australia, which is driving that center. And other institutions, but very few to be quite honest, have internationalization much more as a central and comprehensive strategy of internationalization. And so have a very much more defined mix of rationales than only one or two rationales that are driving their agenda. So in summary, there's not one single model that fits all because the contexts are very different. Uh, to make it very simple, uh, Boston College Internationalization, by its context of being a Jesuit Catholic university uh, and not a top uh, world-class university, but a national research university, has a different kind of rationale for internationalization than Harvard, which is just uh, a few miles away from Boston College. The same applies to uh, the University of Bonn compared to Fachhochschule in Germany. Uh, contexts are quite different. Uh, types of institutions are quite different. So again, not one single model that fits all, not one rationale is driving the internationalization of higher education. We have seen until now some key global trends that have been driving internationalization over the past decades. We have seen a growing importance of internationalization at all levels, uh, where it was originally much more driven uh, by institutions, institutions that now have, according to surveys of the International Association of Universities, something like 70 to 80 percent of universities have an internationalization strategy or have incorporated internationalization as part of their overall strategy. Uh, but we see now also that uh, national governments have strategies. Germany has always been very clear in its uh, national uh, federal approach and his work with the uh, day are day, etc., to create a strategy for internationalization. But we also see that in Canada, we see it in Denmark, we see it in Malaysia, we see it in China. Uh, we see increasingly that national governments also find it important. Of course, the European Commission has a clear strategy for internationalization, uh, and we see that other international entities, as the OECD, the World Bank, have internationalization high on their agenda. So internationalization has become a key aspect of uh, higher education policy at the national, institutional, and at the global level. What we also see there's a trend to increase privatization, where the rationale has become much more uh, driven by markets, driven by revenue. Uh, I mentioned Australia, I mentioned OK, uh, there are several other uh, cases where you can see that uh, that has become more and more important that revenue is driving the agenda markets are driving we need to have much more uh, of a private approach to internationalization we see also the competitive pressures of globalization by global rankings uh, rankings are driving increasingly the internationalization agenda rankings define internationalization in a very narrow and quantitative way. The number of international students, the number of international faculty and scholars, the number of co-publications by uh, international authors, and in the case of multi-rank also, the number of students that go for study abroad as part of their home degree. But they don't look uh, at the quality of what is happening. They don't look at other more uh, substantial pr uh, progress. And so if that drives the agenda for internationalization, and that's why they are doing it is much more driven by we want to increase the rankings, there is a high risk that we are uh, not looking at a substantial qualitative way to internationalization. As a result of that, we see an evidence shift over the past decades from only cooperation, which was much more the way we looked at internationalization by the end of the 1980s, with the exception of Australia and the UK and some other English-speaking countries, to what we see now a much more competitive approach to internationalization. Now the agenda of internationalization is much more driven by we compete for international students, we compete for international talents and scholars, we compete for uh, positions on global rankings, 
we compete for uh, access to top journal publications, we compete for international funding of research, we compete much more than we cooperate. And at the same time, we cannot compete without cooperation, and that will be the big uh, challenge of how we can move forward. Numbers are rising everywhere. Uh, we see a focus on, we are proud that as institutions and as government that we have so many international students or that we send so many students abroad, that we have so much places on the rankings, etc. But what we are, we also another other aspect of it, we are very proud on our website that we have 500 to 1,000 memorandums of understanding of cooperation with partners around the world. Uh, but what is the quality of it? There's not so much focus on quality than there is on quantity. Uh, and that, at the end, might be a big challenge that we have to do. And we will see now, in, uh, and I come back at that again, what will be the implications of the change in global climate that we are facing now on those trends. Will we continue to see much more of the competitive folks, or will we go back to the cooperation? Will we finally make a much more qualitative approach that will be one of the main challenges that we face. Another aspect in when we talk about why internationalization is that we have to place it in the context of what is happening in higher education around the world. And there were many aspects of that, but I focus on three key important ones that we have to discuss. The two main trends that we see in higher education in the world is on the one hand massification, the demand for higher education still being in most countries around the world higher than the supply of higher education. And the other one is the global knowledge economy, that increasingly our economy in the global context is depending on research and quality education by universities around the world. There's a tension between those two, because on the one hand, universities have to respond to the massification, and so uh, that is not so much focused on quality, but on quantity. And that in particular is the case for many uh, universities in the uh, low and mid-income countries that are facing an increasing massification of higher education, access of the middle class, uh, the growing middle class to higher education and how to respond to that. And at the same time, the demand for high quality excellence uh, education at the top level, which is not possible with a massified higher education system. And that's what we see in many uh, developed countries, that there is an increasing interest in developing excellence programs. Uh, we see that in Germany, we see that in France, we see that in Russia, we see it in China for sure, we see it in Japan, in Korea, uh, where we say, well, we cannot support as a government all higher education at the same level. If you want to compete in the global knowledge economy, we have to invest much more in excellence programs. That tension creates increasingly uh, problems of increasing inequality between universities that are uh, not have to respond to the massification and um, those who have are much more at the top end of the higher education and also expressed in the rankings. That process is still going on and has certain strong implications for internationalization because in the global knowledge economy, the focus on internationalization will be much more focused on international research and the recruitment of international top talents of scholars and students, uh, where in the massification sense, it will mainly has an impact in the sense that when there is no sufficient supply or quality supply, then students are going to look for study abroad for their full degree. And that implies the massive growth over the past decades of students who have been going uh, from the developing world to the developed world, now more than 5 million of them studying in another country than their home country. So those two aspects have to be taken into account when we talk about why internationalization, those two factors are very substantial. And in that, the change in global climate uh, is an important factor to see what will happen with those two developments? And if I go to that, we see on the one hand an increased inward looking uh, approach uh, to things, nationalism, 
uh, anti-immigration, anti-global cooperation. We see all kinds of geopolitical tensions happening. Uh, uh, for instance, the, uh, the tensions between China and the United States, uh, Australia and China, uh, all those tensions that uh, also have an enormous impact on, on internationalization of higher education. Will we be possible to collaborate in research between uh, China and the United States, for instance? Will we have international students still coming from China to, uh, to Australia and to uh, the United States? All those factors play an important role. We see economic challenges huh? and the uh, COVID-19 pandemic will have an accelerating impact on those economic challenges. Uh, the economic impact on higher education will be enormous and will increasingly also impact uh, the distinction between the top universities in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the knowledge economy and the universities in particular in developing and emerging countries. So it will increase inequality in higher education, both in the access to higher education and between different types of institutions of higher education that will uh, survive or not. We have seen already uh, cases, in, including the in corruption, fraud, and other et ethics challenges uh, that have been impacting higher education uh, over the past decades. And of course, now even more than before already, we see environmental and health challenges that also have impact on uh, higher education and its internationalization. Uh, the pandemic has made it very clear in the sense that there is, on the one hand, a trend to nationalize and at the same time a need to international collaboration to find a joint faction, for instance. Uh, we see um, the impact on climate change, the whole sustainable development, uh, and I'm go going back to that. So all that imp influences why are we doing this. Uh, we also by that have to see well what are the key challenges when we talk about internationalization for the future are we moving from a focus on internationalization much more on mobility uh, to an internationalization at home and will the COVID-19 crisis impact that will we see that uh, there will be much more attention to uh, curriculum to learning outcomes and competencies for all students or will we continue to focus more in an unequal uh, higher education system on mobility of a small elite will the relationship and partnerships from north south which has always been very unequal will they continue to be strongly unequal where the power of the relationship is much more in the north and the south is much more in an equal uh, relationship Will international stations still be mostly marginal and fragmented as hoc, or will it be much more integrated in the overall mission? Will we continue to be much more institutionally uh, or, uh, and not linked to the global and local needs of society? That are key questions that we have to ask for the future. And at the same time, we have to place it in the context of globalization of internationalization, as, Jay Knight, uh, as, as Albert Jones and I have been saying uh, already in 2014, where we saw that the perception of internationalization in the developing world was much more that it is something of a Western, largely Anglo-Saxon, a predominantly English-speaking paradigm. Will it be that we this trend will change that we see that more and more internationalization gets its own identity its own rationales its own focus in africa and latin america and asia of course we see it already happening in china to a certain extent where there is a strong focus on uh, internationalization of higher education from a chinese perspective we see it elsewhere happening although at the same time as we uh uh, studied in the case of a World Bank study on national policies in low and mid income countries, we still see the trend that many national uh, policies of internationalization in the developing world are mainly focusing on copying what the Western world has been doing. So, will there be a chance in this new context of an own approach, an own development of rationales for internationalization? Will be one of the big questions for. The next decade 
To keep that into mind, we have two components of, uh, of internationalization. Uh, my colleague Jay Knight has been writing about that. She says, well, there's on the one hand an internationalization abroad component, and the other side is the internationalization at home. And although the two cannot be exclusively uh, separated from each other, uh, because they at the end have to be a focus on can we create a global learning for all, as Betty Lisk and I have been writing about it, it's a fact that internationalization abroad is still the dominant approach to internationalization of higher education. And again, it has different components. Have the student degree mobility, where students go for a full degree abroad, which is most of the five million I mentioned before that do that, and mostly is from the south to the north. We have student credit mobility, where students go abroad as part of their home degree for six weeks or a semester or a year. That is still dominantly present in Europe, thanks to the Erasmus program, and in the United States, thanks to the study abroad program but will be very much challenged by uh, the current global climate. Uh, we have students short-term mobility in the sense of certificates for language and for summer courses, etc. We have, of course, staff mobility, and we have program mobility, and that is the franchise operations, branch campuses, etc. That is still perceived as being the dominant focus of internationalization of uh, higher education. And the at-home component, uh, creating a campus internationalization, internationalization the curriculum, uh, making teaching and learning much more international, for instance, and digital, all those aspects, competencies and learning outcomes is very much more important, but still is not so dominant in our strategic approach. To come back very quickly, uh, if we talk about rationales, is the key aspect we have when we have strategies, we have to talk about the why we're internationalizing, the theme of this event, the what we are doing, the how we are doing it, and what is the outcomes and the impact of what we are doing. And the why and the outcomes and impact are, in essence, the basis for an internationalization strategy. And the what and how comes out of that. But we have seen in the past, and I've been involved in many evaluations, that many institutions, many governments, uh, many entities forget about first answering the question why in our internal and external context are doing this? And what will be the impact on the quality of what we are doing? So that is very essential why this topic is so uh, important. I don't have time to go into this, but this is what, based on a circle by Jay Knight and further developed by me, is the first thing you have to do is to analyze the context of why we are doing this as an institution. Create awareness among your stakeholders. Create commitment for your strategy. And then you can talk about planning, uh, operationalization, so the what and the how, and you can implement it. But you have constantly review the context, and you always have to look into what is the impact on teaching, research, and service. So how does it contribute to the quality of what you're doing? If you don't do that as a strategy, you basically don't have a clear strategy. That's very important to keep in mind. So to summarize in what is the current situation, mobility for short-term or long-term economic gain is still driving the agenda, together with increasingly talent recruitment for our knowledge economy and the rankings. And short-term and long-term economic gain in that sense is different, in, for instance, like in the UK and Australia, where the revenue is very important, where in Germ Germany, where you don't have revenue, not for international students, it's the long-term economic gain. Had to create uh, much more the ambassadors for the economy and for the country, and also to create places in your knowledge economy for talents that you don't have enough at home. So that's driving very much the agenda. But what is needed is much more a comprehensive strategy of why we internationalize and a focus on the curriculum and learning outcomes to enhance the quality of what you're doing. So this is the definition. I don't go into that uh, of comprehensive internationalization by uh, my colleague from the United States, John Hutzek, who describes that you have to 
improve everything, that you have to bring it into all aspects of, uh, of your institution to make a comprehensive internationalization strategy. And internationalization at home, as defined by Jos Balen and Albert Jones, uh, talks about how we can make a purposeful integration of international intercultural dimension in the formal and informal curriculum for all students at home. So not with the mobility aspects, but say, can we address those issues also at home? Uh, coming back to the original basis for internationalization at home, where the people in Malmö who started it uh, said, well, we always talk about the 5% of students who go into Erasmus, but what about the 95% of the students that are don't go? Internationalization abroad is very elitist. Still it is. And we might have gone from 5% to 20% in Europe, thanks to Erasmus. We might have 10% in the United States, uh, thanks to the fact that study abroad has been very important in many institutions, but in the world global environment, is only one to two percent. So what about the 98 percent of the world that is not internationally broad? And when we have a strategy focused only on that. Internationalization of the curriculum, which I think is the most essential part, is by my colleague Betty List described as the process of incorporating international intercultural and global dimensions into the content of the curriculum, as well as the learning outcomes, the way we assess those learning outcomes, the way we teach those learning outcomes, and the way we support those programs in making that happen. Uh, many people perceive international shared curriculum as only the content, but I think the learning outcomes, the assessment of them, and the teaching methods and support services are equally important to rest when we talk about internationalization of the curriculum. Another aspect which has been not so much uh, addressed until recently is the third mission of the university. Uh, Many internationalization strategies focus on research and or teaching, but not so much on service to society. And we see that universities have increasingly an important role in social responsibility to society, uh, similar to what we see in the corporate world, more and more attention to the social responsibility role. And internationalization has to do that as well. And I wrote about that recently with my colleagues, uh, Uwe Brandenburg, Elspeth Jones, and Betty Lisk, uh, saying internationalization for society. Uh, so looking at the sustainable development goals, looking at inequality, looking at uh, what we do uh, in, in the current situation with our research for solving um, pandemics. All those kind of aspects become more and more important. So we have to add to our rationales also why are we doing this to include the social responsibility of, uh, of universities as an important rationale? We have to look, and I mentioned that, uh, to strategic, more strategic in our partnerships, not looking at quantity of how many memorandums of understandings we have, which are not very active, but looking at how can we make strategic partnerships in which we improve the quality of what we are doing by complementary to its other, but also in the same level playing field. So not, not thinking that as a University of Applied Sciences, you can partner strategically with Harvard. On an individual basis, you might, but not as an institution. Not looking at too many uh, partners, but looking at what are quality partners. L involving all the different stakeholders in them. That's a very important part. Then you have strategic partnerships that are becoming much more effective. And that's um, something for the future to think about as well. Now we say it's important to focus on all learning, so don't make it an elitist approach because mobility is only reaching a very small percentage and all students, even if they're going to work in Bonn around the corner, they still have to be both international professionals and citizens that are connected to the divided the world. Not in the sense that they all have to become diplomats or CEOs of multinationals, but they have to have a minimum basis of uh, competencies to be operating in a globally connected world. And that creates a profile of, of global learners and uh, uh, scholars. Uh, and uh, these are eight of the important aspects that we have uh, to see when we talk about the future of internationalization, uh, why we're doing this. We have to create global learners and over that are open to diverse perspectives and sources of knowledge that are able to critique new ideas and regardless of origin, have the reflection and self-critical skills, 
respectful for those who have the reverse linguistic and cultural skills, able to work in multicultural teams to analyze and solve problems, to be flexible and resilient and adaptable and creative, committed to actions that benefit others as well as self, and transferable skills as curiosity, problem solving skills, tolerance, and confidence. So you see the word internationalization is not part of those global learning, but it's all embedded in the same kind of concept that we think is very essential. So what does it mean for defining internationalization of higher education? In an exercise we did for the European Parliament in 2015, we said, well, we asked several of our scholars around the world, if you have to define it now, what do we think that the future internationalization strategy has to be. And they said it has to be more inclusive and less elitist. Mobility still is important, but it has to become part of, of the internationalized curriculum. Uh, so it should not be some kind of separate academic tourism, but it has to be integrated. We have to re-emphasize the internationalization of the goal itself, but it means to enhance quality and it should not focus solely on economic rationales. And so the definition, which is an updated definition from the working definition of J. Knight, says it has to be an intentional process. It doesn't go by itself of integrating the international intercultural global dimension to the purpose and functions and delivery of post-secondary education, but in order to enhance the quality of education and research for all students and staff and to make a meaningful contribution to a society. If we would have one rationale for internationalization that applies to everything. This should be, in our view, the important rationale, how we define internationalization, because it brings together all the aspects that we need in response to the uh, past focus on exclusive uh, elitism by mobility, a focus on the competitive environment, uh, much more than the collaborative environment. And if we look then to close down, uh, the, for the next decade, what the COVID-19, but not only the COVID-19, the economic crisis related to that, the increasing geopolitical tension, etc. Uh, what do we do? We need to return to a more cooperative and less market-oriented approach to internationalization. We have to take advantage of lessons learned in the pandemic, realizing uh, global learning for all, making use of online expertise, but not replacing on-site by online learning. If one of the things have become very clear in the past months when we were starting to discuss the reopening of universities was that online education, we have learned a lot from it and it has become a very important part, even more than already was the case, of higher education, but it can never replace on-site higher education. Students, faculty, campuses, learning environments need to be uh, interactive and need to have an environment where students can meet inside and outside the classroom among themselves, with the faculty, etc. But that's a very important lesson. Take opportunity of what we have learned in online expertise, for instance, in collaborative online learning, but not replacing it. Link internationalization to the third mission, service to society, sustainable development goals, and at the same time make internationalization more carbon neutral. Mobility in itself, positive, but not available for all and not sustainable, is also a lesson that we have to learn. I end with two quotes, which we wrote already in 2018 and the next one in 2019, which I think are very clearly demonstrating why we have to set a new agenda for internationalization of higher education. This one was by Jay Knight and myself, and we said, as we look backwards and forward, it is this important to ask one question. What are the core principles and values underpinning internationalization of higher education that 10 or 20 years from now will make us look back and be proud of the track record and contribution that international higher education has made to the more interdependent world we live in? The next generation of citizens and the bottom billion uh, people living in poverty on our planet. That question is still even more important in the current situation than it was already two, two years ago. And in other words, as Betty Lisk and I wrote in 2019, aligning the practice of internationalization with human values and the common global good, requires that we first challenge some of our long held views about what it is to be international as a university, a teacher, a student, a human being. This requires pushing the boundaries of our own and others thinking 
focusing on people and ensuring that they develop and demonstrate the institutions espoused human values. Pushing the boundaries of internationalization is one of the biggest challenges that we have to do. If we don't learn our lessons from the current crisis on how we can do better, then the question of why has not been answered in the correct way. Thank you very much.